Welcome to Dad and Sons, the most acceptable quality podcast in my own entire zip code. My name's George Weedman, and I have with me our two usual hosts, Liam Edwards and Matt Visual. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> Liam Edwards? <laughs> what? Mm-hmm. He gets, he, he's not afraid of putting his real name out there, right? Well. Well, my name is... <laughs> It is bleep. <laughs> and this week, I am happy to adopt into our family, if you will, an esteemed guest, someone who, uh, you know, knows the game. This week, we have a chungus among us, the Mississippian with the mostest. We have escapist headliner, wrestling personality, and suited up revolutionary and cap warrior, Comrade Jim Sterling. How are you? <laughs> That was brilliant. Oh, thanks. That was fantastic. I loved that. All of that. I'll take that home. Brilliant. If, okay, so adopted now? What What role play have I... Which one's my daddy? Because I, I wasn't briefed about that bit before we started. The, the audience actually gets to decide. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Or, or Wait, or is Jim our new dad? Actually... Oh, don't take this away from me. Oh. I would love to have a dad. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be brilliant. You have at least three. You should have thought of that so, beforehand. So, like, like if someone says, "Thank God for Jim Sterling's son," who are they talking to? Who is the son, and who is the dad in the contextual, imaginary context of that that conversation? What you've done there is you've taken two catchphrases and you've cut them up and welded them together like a cut and shut job at a at an illegal car lot. Well, well it is it is like a religion. It, it it is basically a religion. The audience like has their own version of our our dogma here, which is that some of us are dads and some of us are sons, and whichever one is the case, that's the divine mystery. Right, right. So I mean, I don't I I feel like I have divine liberty, uh, divine authority if you will, to uh, you know, edit up the dogma, chop it up as I will, enforce new rules. I'll be perfectly I mean, I... honest with you. As with most religious discussions, I'll, you lost me about halfway through. <laughs> I've got no idea what this conversation is about anymore. I mean, in this case, Jim, you can have three dads. Three up. Profit. Loving it. Speaking of religious beliefs, you make videos about um, 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 economic beliefs that, uh, that, 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 that are held by, by the people in the... Uh, if not the highest echelons of the video game industry, then the highest paychecks of the video game industry. That's right, I do videos about pricks in suits. <laughs> Funnily enough, it's hosted by a prick in a suit, so it's all okay, it cancels out. I feel like the religion metaphor can be taken even further there, but <clears throat> anyways. We take uh, tithings from from our congregations through through Patreon, and I, I fear... You commit to the economical bit, don't you? <laughs> Yes, yes. Brilliant. Uh, let's see. What, what's, what, what rhymes with Nicene? I want to make a Nicene creed. Just a, actually, just a nice creed. Anyways, um, so I, I fear that in the next few years, we're going to see Patreon go through a similar cycle of becoming way too big to not attract bad investors and make big, bad mistakes like move their financial headquarters over to a European country with laxer tax rolls and, and ended up canceling a lot of people's transactions. I, 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 I wonder, like, like, do you fear the same thing happening to Patreon and, and our, our models of, of funding and content creation that has happened to, to the, 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 the corrupt authoritarians, if you will, of the video yeah. game industry? <clears throat> All right, let me explain how business in this economic system works, right? Right. There is a long length of pipe. In this, uh, along this pipe, right, <laughs> mm. there are various outlets that come out like spouts. Okay. 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 Now, a dose of lethal but very compressed gas is running through this pipe, and it goes mm. on for miles. Just waiting to burst out. Yeah. And imagine your business is a pig, a live, squealing, hairy, bare ass pig. I'm picturing a pig in, in the mountains in Alaska with the pipeline behind it, kind yeah. of bursting at the seams. It can be in Alaska, sure. I mean, I think of pipes. I think I actually do think of Alaska. Brilliant. So you got your your Alaskan pig, and it's a good Alaskan pig. It's made a lot of people happy. It's it's a product of hard work, is that pig? So what you do is you turn that pig backwards and you force it onto one of the gas spouts. Wow. Up its ass. Wow. You duct tape its mouth shut. Oh my god. 
Mm. Poor animal. At this point, I should I should um, make very clear to you, this is a fictional business pig that isn't alive and doesn't feel pain. In fact, it loves this. Right, right. We are role playing right now. Yeah. The, this is this pig loves this. Wait, are we role playing or is the pig role playing? It, it, it's, 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 it's all in our heads. It's, it's religion, whatever. It, either way, the pig's wearing a top hat. <laughs> so the pig's loving this because the gas, though lethal, uh, produces a dizzying high. So it goes up the pig. The pig's loving it, but as the gas fills up its gummy works, it expands and it keeps expanding, and a crowd's gathered round the pig. And they've paid to keep the gas going into the pig. And they want to see that pig get bigger. And so it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then it bursts and covers everyone in toxic guts and they die. Good point. Very well stated. Uh, we, we have yet to learn as a society that pigs can only be inflated so much. Yeah, yeah. There are many pigs out there who will remain the same size that they currently are, and that's okay, that's beautiful, that is natural. On the other hand, sometimes pigs, like we saw this week, sometimes pigs get so big that they have their legs cut off. And then... <laughs> oh. And then it just oh. rolls down wow. the hill. Yeah. Screeching. <laughs> Screeching in agony about its latest deals and yeah, losses. Yeah, they... They kick that pig into a lake, and then they just help themselves to another few armfuls of piglets and start so, the process all over as, again. As, as the pig is rolling down the hill, the pig's like, this was my best year! This was my best year! Oh, yeah, yeah, that pig was brilliant before they cut its legs off. <laughs> that pig was having a whale of a time, loving it. And all it the, was all a the... record year for me as a pig. The and people inside the pig, because I've now expanded the metaphor to include the layoffs, the people that were living inside the pig <laughs> thought things couldn't get better, but every now and then they would see, like, these finger marks from outside as Bobby Kotick was just, like, sticking his fingers in the sides of the pig, just seeing <laughs> if it was ready to cut its legs off and kick it down. I, I'll be perfectly honest, like a pig without legs that's been kicked down a hill this metaphor has completely gotten away from me if if if, if patreon yeah. was the pig how long do you think the patreon pig has has in it because because this year we've seen a lot of uh uh declined payments we've seen a lot of new investors on board we've seen attempts to make this pig bigger but patreon as a concept is a middleman of a website that stores like text and some some avatars and arranges payment processing. And it's hard to imagine them including a, like, Patreon game store or a Patreon social network. Uh, well, I actually kind of think of it. I guess I kind of uh, Patreon uh, social I mean, network. It's got blogging tools. <laughs> right, right. You know, you can use it as a blog if you want. I've seen, you know, various people with Patreons use that as a, as a function of what they do. Yeah, yeah no, I actually... Yeah, do, so there, there yeah, are social yeah. elements built in. Um, the way Jack Hunt has been speaking about where they need to generate, quote-unquote, need to generate their revenue. Um, the way he's speaking, I'm imagining things like Patreon premiums. Um, that, like, some sort of uh, subscription or paid service, um, which could apply to perhaps both patrons and creators. Um, they've said something about merchandising, maybe working with creators, I would imagine, to create merchandise for them or work with them to distribute something like that. Oh, um, instead of the artists out there. Who, yeah, uh, there are could, could do basically. It all independently. Yeah, That's how that, this pig's going to get big. I see, I see. If you look at the game industry for long enough, you can see in almost any other industry, because it's all related, it's, it's, it's all within the same system. Um, you can see in other companies. If you look at it with a cynical eye, like where can they shave something off and resell it and like dress it up as value? Um, what are they already doing that they can start charging for or they can upgrade to start charging for? Like you could start seeing that in any business, really. Um, and with Patreon, like with their blogging tools and um, the added services uh, that they could provide, like you can see what they might do. And I, I, I'm going to guess, and it's not, like, 100% at all, but I would guess that Patreon Premium is something they'd be eyeing up, like, in the next two two to three years, I guess, within. Um, hmm. But that's just a wild guess out my ass. So, But it's just, 
looking at the way Jack Kirby is speaking. What, what, what could they possibly give creators like, for example, you and George, who I've obviously seen the successes of what Patreon can offer. What can yeah. they offer you more that would make you want to stay with them, but also then have to maybe share more of your revenue or something? Well, that's the question. And, and the harder you have to rack your brains to think about it, the more bollocks the offering will probably be when they come up with something. Yeah. Because they might just be desperately trying to yank something out of their asses. Um, but, the, like, for instance, um, I had a, a video I made, um, which I haven't put up anywhere yet because it doesn't feel like a fit for my YouTube channel. Um, it... it probably wouldn't get all that many views and there's always that superstition about youtube about if it's not as popular it might drag your channel down um and all you've got to do is work on guesswork and superstitions to try and work out youtube's eldritch algorithms and things i mean Um, we put this podcast on george's channel once and it tanked everything well there you go there you go oh yeah um so anyway I, i got this 15 minute video i made and thought well you can host files on patreon um so i tried that but they do not currently uh, allow you to upload anything larger than god i think it's like 200 megabytes or something like basically you can do audio which, um, which should keep hosting costs small should do but yeah. then if they look to aggressively expand which is you know slow and steady does not win the race in their minds but then again there's no end to this race um they could try to, and it might, again, be disastrous long-term because the costs could then escape them, but they might offer, you know, maybe we take a 10% of your cut and we'll offer you expanded ways to uh, host things on Patreon. And they could sell that as, you know, direct engagement and stuff like that. So then they want the creators to invest? I mean, that's, again, just me pulling something out of the air. Are, are, are creators supposed to be investing then if they're, like, increasing the amount of share they take? Because they don't take 10% right now. I believe they take five. five. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm just trying to think of something. I'm just being cynical here. It's, I'm not saying Patreon's going to do it. I'm just looking at what could be done. Um, so I'm not saying Patreon would want to do that, but it does seem like they want a bigger cut somehow, some way. Um, cause they got investors now. Well, yeah. I mean, there's talk now about, um, how generous that is. And you've always got to worry when it goes from, Hey, here's this cool service to financial reports and, and blogs and, and more mainstream sort of, um, coverage of it then talking about how generous it is because once you get a company start thinking that they're being kind they immediately want to rectify that problem (laughs) and and i can't help but imagine the anime sweat uh droplet coming down someone's someone's head when 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 they make an idea that they think (laughs) is a million dollar idea but suddenly investors give them like 50 million dollars they're like oh god how do i how do i what do i it seems like that's that's the trouble I foresee with the future of Patreon is is being able to earn back how much more they're trying to expand yeah. on it. Well, it, it seems to be a problem facing most companies that grow, really. Yes. Um, to stay successful, you've got to be not successful too much. <laughs> If you want very, you know, something very steady and sustainable. Hollywood accountants know all those tricks. All, all the big movies that make all the money are uh, probably registered as losses by their accountants. Probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and with, uh, especially with these newer tech companies and things, it seems like all they care about is getting into that that race, that let's grow massive, massive, massive. And there just seems to be no... Long. I mean, I say that as if it's different from, you know, old, supposedly wise video game executives who end up doing the same <laughs> thing. So I guess there isn't really any difference. It's just, I suppose if you're in the business founding business, I, I suppose, um, that is all you think about is how, how big an empire can I grow and how quickly can I do it? Um, but the problem is, is you end up like that guy in the live-action Popeye movie is kicking his hat on the ground every time he tries to pick it up. You end up in a race (laughs) with yourself, and you can't win it. 
because you're chasing something to which there's no finish line. Uh, and eventually you run out of fuel and everyone gets off the car that's trying to kick its own hat. I've mixed up metaphors again. There was like the news the other day that Unity were thinking of going like public on the stock exchange at some point in 2020. And it's just like... But you know who's in charge of Unity, don't you? Actually, who's that? I don't... Jo- John Riccatello. Really? That's where yeah, that guy I, ended up. Funnily enough, I, I saw it this morning because I, I was writing the script for next Monday's Jimquisition this morning. Um, and I was looking up Shit, executives that's that and CEOs and uh, ended up mentioning John Riccatello and, and looked him up, see what, what's he doing now. Um, he was involved with that uh, the company that I used the meme from, whose name I forgot, the uh, guys that said let's turn players into payers uh he was involved with that for a little while um but yeah currently his ceo of unity technologies wow former ea darling who of yep. course led such a prosperous and wonderful ea life until he was fired uh oh, fired great. for severe underperformance but <laughs> A CEO of Unity Technologies, because none of those guys ever not land on their feet. Oh yeah, so, and even if Bobby Kotick got fired, I guess. Oh, he could. He he would land into a cushy position, <laughs> He'd equivalent be like position. Patreon's next CEO. Anywhere else, <laughs> probably. Yeah. So, <laughs> this is all. This is all peachy and bright. I got. I got another one. Um. This is this is something that that concerns me as I as I grow from from a, a strapping young lad into a confused old man, and uh, that is that nowadays I I feel I fear that video games in general are are gonna gradually become less and less cool for future generations as pop culture and society and entertainment at large shift over to more mobile mediums. Do you fear a similar sort of future? Do you think video games have a have a matter of decades left in them? I'll be dead by then. I'm not too concerned. Oh, you think so? Okay. <laughs> well, well, I mean... Um, no, I mean, um, I, I don't... I, I've never really thought of them that way. Do, do we think we have them for the rest of our lifetimes? In some form. I mean, they seem to have just sort of settled in now. They yeah. seem to have just settled in along with the other entertainment mediums. I don't think there are any you... great risk right now being replaced at all. Yeah, would you say that about movies? Do you think movies are going to disappear? Uh, I expect TV soon, too. I mean, Fortnite is everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. You go to Target, you see Fortnite toys. They sell little Fortnite loot chests. They sell the pinatas they sell a horse riding toy i was in target the other day i saw it everywhere fortnite everywhere um is it a grocery cart with a spring on the bottom it's a horse i think it might be a a toy horse of the pinata (laughs) (laughs) got a little wheel on the bottom and everything as physical Mm -hmm. things delightful well i mean it's an evolution of you know the old uh the blind box things it's all the same. That's true. It's all you a racket. tons of them here in Japan, so I guess nothing to complain about. Speaking of Battle Royale games, though. Matt and I have been playing Apex Legends uh, a lot mm. over the uh, past few days, and I, I really liked my first day with it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, George likes to win. I, I'm not usually in these, in these types of games. Uh, Fortnite... Don't care. PUBG didn't care, but this one, uh, this one's pretty nice. It's especially nice when, when you know, when when you win. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I, I got one win. So a lot of second This places, is the stupidest thing that I think. Okay, it's not the stupidest thing that happened in my life. It's one of the great unexplicable phenomenon of the universe, I guess. If, if, you know, to bring it back to you know the the, the dad and son nice creed, a uh, uh, religious dogma I'm working with here. Um, I, I, a divine act of dad happened, and that was that when I first booted up Apex Legends on day one, I played for about an hour, and then I won a round with anonymous randos. I got on the Discord, uh, the Bunny Hop Discord, got a group together, played some, went back and forth. Typically, ended up in like the top. I want to say like 15. And then I played again later that night with randos again and did like really, really well. Like I have videos of me wiping out entire squads with the wingman pistol. And for the two days following, 
it was just straight up losing streaks because those were the days when the people who have been like playing obsessively and have 500 kills by now started showing up. <laughs> That's interesting because I can chime in here because I only played the game for an hour yesterday and it was my first experience. And whilst the movement and everything is amazing and feels mm -hmm. like Titanfall, which Titanfall 2 is, you know, one of the best shooters in modern times. Uh, yeah, that game is already way past any ability for me to be able to join in and learn without getting absolute fucking <laughs> You're doing it wrong. I'm not one to say people are playing games wrong, but... You just, you just did, Jim. You always play with randos, right? Yeah. Because the odds that you will get... <sighs> on the team with someone with 500 kills and let them carry you to success, ah. it's better than any oh, loot box that's odds. Dirty. Ah. I've been winning in this game more than I have any other battle royale. And you've been playing with randos or with friendos? Mostly randos. I can't believe that I have noticed the exact same. I thought it was an act of dad but it was apparently just how this game picks and chooses people it matches them up with. Jim, Jim's an adopted dad, so it could be an active dad. There, there could be a great dad up there directing me to win. The great dad uh, conspiracy. I've been having games. great fun with it. I've been yeah. having great fun yeah. with it. Don't, don't get me it's, wrong. Like It's just like incredibly weird to me that I'm doing better with, with anonymous people I don't talk with versus friends I have on mics. And actually maybe it just kind of keeps the comms clear because the game's ping system really does make up the difference yeah i mean i've i i'm i usually avoid like squad play in these games um battle royales because i don't get on with people I, I don't like talking to people <laughs> um from an anxiety standpoint we appreciate um, you taking the time <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Like, ran, ran, random chat freaks me out sometimes, so I don't really go in for it. Um, but the ping system in this has been amazing. And it's yeah. made me to the point where when I first started it, I was a bit annoyed. Like, why isn't there solo play? To now where people are talking about they need to update it with social, uh, solo play, I'm like, I don't need it. I'm fine. Like, have it if you want it, but I don't need it. Yeah, uh, the squad was... system works so well without talking to people. And in, if anything, every time I've been on a squad where people are talking, they've lost. And, and they can be people who know each other or they can be people who are strangers. Most of the time, if people are chattering on the mic, they lose. It might be a concentration thing. Yeah, it might, I, I'm wondering if, if hearing little subtle footstep noises really does make the, that much of a difference. I will say that saved my ass a few times in the game, being able to pick out directionally where someone is just from hearing them. Well, if you don't like talking to people on the internet, this is the first game I've seen that has a straight up voice to text option. <laughs> so you can just turn everyone's voice off and see uh, the computer try to imagine what they were saying and and picture in your head Kermit the Frog saying these lines <laughs> instead of uh, a angry 14-year-old child. I really appreciate it, though. They, these The folks at Respawn really seem to care about people who do not have mic access, who maybe can't talk, yeah. who like, maybe this can't, is the you first know, game. hear for a while that I've noticed where the communication options and the way you communicate with other players in this game is like something that was integral to their game design document for this. Yes. Yeah. And like that ping system comes straight out of like MOBAs with like the ease of use and the fact that it has such a variety of different options that you can ping that once you start getting into the game, it's so easy to communicate without ever yeah. having to talk to anyone. And I do it for fun. Like, I'll, I'll, they could tell that someone's been through the area. The doors are open. But I will make the character say someone's been here just to, as part of the experience. I just enjoy using the ping thing. It's, it's very smart. You can ping the angles you are looking at. You, you, you can ping what kind of <laughs> ammo you need. You can ping whether or not you need a, a magazine attachment or a scope attachment. I was reading mm -hmm. about how they... How Some they characters. Did it. And it was like they play tested for months or where the whole mm. team were like in squads doing voice comms between and, each and other. And changed their names so everyone didn't know each other. Yeah. And they, yeah. they would pick out the stuff that uh, came up more often. Like, so for example, like they, what you're looking at or like how 
if the doors are open and someone's been through there, like the same like s speech patterns that would come up over and over again. And they were like, okay, we need to like make a ping for this or like something like this seems to come up more often than this. And it's just like, it comes back to, you know, like having an idea and then reiterating on top of it and going and getting and nailing it down. And the one thing that's amazing about Apex, even from just looking outside of it and having only played it for an hour is that that game obviously it got leaked and all that kind of thing but a couple of days but that game came out on the day it was announced <laughs> nowhere yeah and it didn't have any networking issues like some anthem ea game that i heard. <laughs> there's some syrupy molasses yeah. walking it slows it, it activates bullet time if yeah, the server's having trouble to like this make game that didn't have a beta it didn't have a demo it didn't have anything but internal testing it came mm -hmm. out and it's an online battle royale game that not only did well, but, I mean, we'll talk about it later, got on really well, but seemingly without any issues. Indeed. And introduced yeah. all of these, like, mil. very core game design philosophies. Like I would also say, like, no fall look damage. at what Respawn's history so is. Look at what their wheelhouse is versus look at what Bioware's wheelhouse is. Uh, and, and it's an argument I've been making a bit more recently about letting developers make the games that are in their skill set rather than trying to make them do something yeah, that yeah. isn't necessarily... Even if they might be adept at it or they've managed to do some of it in the past, if it's not their core yeah. thing, they're going to have more issues with it. If you it. looked at Dragon Age and you looked at Titanfall 2 and you're like, which of these two teams would make a better bo Battle Royale game? You, eh, yeah, well. so, you know, it... it that may be a factor in why Anthem has run like utter ass on its demos because it's, I mean, you know, we, we can look at Bethesda as well with Fallout 76, look at the terrible issues that had running online. It was something they hadn't done before. And, and it's not as if I'm saying like never do anything new, but maybe don't kick off with Anthem developed by Bioware as an online focused thing that you're expecting to save your hide next financial quarter. They dumped a lot of money in Anthem and half a decade ago, they dumped a lot of money in getting the Titanfall <laughs> franchise going. And it's surprising to see that this is the big mainstream. Hit. I don't doubt though. I don't doubt that Anthem will be okay though. I think Anthem will be fine in the long run. You think so? Not as is as it will be a fine game. I think it will just it will have a base of players that like Destiny will keep it going through turbulent times. I don't know. It's what got could. at this point a seventy five percent chance of selling below expectations in an yeah. investor report. But I think the long tail for a game like that, especially with it just existing in the background, kind of like Destiny does is probably what's going to happen to it. I think, especially now, Apex Legends is pretty much just like stalling every ounce of thunder <laughs> that it possibly mm. could have gotten this month. It's just kind of going to exist in the background. We'll see. I just, I, I, I'm just, not hopeful for Anthem. I'm not going to say it's going to fail. I'm just, right now, I've got... Nothing about it has inspired any faith in it. And yeah, really, it struggled to generate much interest from me. I played the demo. It's a competent shooter, but nothing about the world stood out to me. Nothing about the story stuck at all in my brain. Um, even the gameplay, after a while, it was just there. Nothing really felt like it had much impact. Isn't that the same um, as Destiny, though? That's what I mean. Like, they're probably just going to exist in the same space of, like, life games. Well, this is the thing. People have Destiny. Do they need another Destiny? Mm. This, this is the same arguments we had last generation when everything tried to be Call of Duty, and many, most FPSs failed in that Miserably. generation. I remember yeah. a quote from the Time Splitter dev who was just like, most FPSs that get made fail they they just fail um and part of that is because halo was filling a certain niche and um call of duty was selling us uh filling a certain niche so every time ea was was one of the ones that would be like right medal of honor is going to be like call of duty now um the other one the battlefield um <laughs> all tried to chase that trend and failed because market leaders lead they're not following other people in the market 
That's yeah. why they're leaders. Um, and everyone wanted to do it. And a- then you get good games like Titanfall 2 and everyone and doesn't play it. And it's like, well, it's your own damn fault. For- well, I mean, EA ah. hamstrung that as well. I mean, yeah. that's one of the issues. That's what makes Anthem difficult for me to really guess even at how well it's going to do. Um, because it's a weird release time. I it's... just feel like it's going to come out and that everyone for a week will remember and then it will sink into... It'll have its base and then... No, I'm just... I'm, I'm worried. I'm worried about Bioware because before Visceral got canned, um, they were put to work on Battlefield Hardline, which was out of their wheelhouse. Oh, yeah. Didn't have any builds the cops for, and like, before one. it. Yeah. How long has it been since we've thought of those words right? in our head? Battlefield Hardline. I only remember it because when I played it, I was thinking, Visceral's on the way out. This feels like a typical, uh, what I call a unicronic arts move, where they're wow. about to swallow it. Do you, and... think, do you think Bioware is... It's weird to think of a, a, a games industry without Bioware. You could have asked someone in the UK in the 90s if they could imagine the UK gaming scene without Bullfrog. And That's look true. what EA did to that. Yeah. Um, oh, Lionhead. Oh, my God. Lionhead. Um, well, that, they were Microsoft? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they were the feeble. Yeah, I mean, other, it happens in other companies, but certainly EA's got this habit. Pandemic, mythic. Um, <gasps> others, there's like 20 or something over the years that they've just absorbed and eventually destroyed. Uh, and it, it, it absolutely could happen to Bioware. I'm not saying it will, but I think a lot of their continued survival is going to depend on Anthem. Um, they've got a new Dragon Age coming out, of course, but if Anthem, hmm. it, it's going to be basically balancing the scales. Unless Anthem does really well, of course, then it won't. But if Anthem tanks for whatever reason, that Dragon Age is going to have to do some severe rebalancing. Otherwise, I think EA might be giving them their marching orders. Oh, yeah, they announced a new Dragon Age game. It's kind of... I forgot about that. So, move, moving back to Apex Legends, how, how long do you think it'll be before EA mucks <laughs> this up? With microtransactions. Well, I mean, right now... They're already pretty rough, aren't they? Like, I see you can buy currency in the thousands, but each microtransaction is like 1,100, and it's like, ha ha ha. Yeah, so you have to buy the next tier up, and then you can't buy two. And I did just now unlock my first character. I think I want to say... After, it, like, 15 hours, right? Yeah, it took, it took a, three days of... Like yeah, it's sitting like, down for good long three hour sessions each it's day. It's not great. I mean, obviously, I've seen way worse, but that's not really, that's never an excuse for something of, yeah. you know, another company did it worse. Um, the loot boxes are a shame. This is the kind of game that I would have gladly pumped money into. Um, I went as far as the Founders They're... Pack just because I feel like I am playing this an equivalent level to where I'll put my money where my mouth is. Um, just for everything mm-hmm. I. Those loot boxes are falling out of the sky for me when when i like hopped on yesterday i, I had 11 of them to it, sit through it slows as you level up and it, it there's a there's a bit of like you can feel a bit of uh, attempted manipulation there where it's like you level up and you're expecting that oh we're yeah. present and then it's like oh no now where am i going to get my fix and then i guess eventually the uh currency they give you as rewards for leveling up is going to trickle down to mm. matt how 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 do you feel about Apex Legends considering like you don't play these games at all yet? I think he's actually the expert here. <laughs> Wait, what, do you, what do you mean? I'm not the expert. I think you've played more than me and I think you are better than me now at this point. I mean, let's be honest, George. That's kind of the the the, the wheelhouse of the show is that me and Matt always get better than you. <laughs> what do you get? No, it's, no that's not. It says in the scriptures that that that's not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for the wing. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> no, I I I tend to try a game when it comes out. You know, at least dip, oh, let dip, me see. It's free. Let me see how it is. Dip it. Yeah, a little pinky toe. Um, and then I hear I keep hearing Apex Legends in the in the chat. So I was like, ah, oh, let me download it. And I played it. and I was like. Oh, the music is pretty good. <laughs> Music's pretty good. Okay. Okay. Pretty good. You know, the play. way you go down to... Uh, 
to land on the on the map and everything, you you can go with your group. I don't know if that's new. I think I've seen that in another game as well. I really? can't remember. Because I, I love that. Like, I love not having to pay attention to where I'm jumping. Yeah, and, uh, you know, you just relinquish uh, jump yeah. master privileges to someone who knows what let, they're let doing. The randos take the I wheel. used to do that a lot because I yeah. didn't uh, want the responsibility. But I've started doing it a exactly. bit more because now I'm like, stop landing where everyone else is landing. I can't <laughs> handle that. <laughs> I'm the other. I'm the other way. I as soon as I played like uh, five hours, I was like, oh, we're going down deep. <laughs> we're going immediately. We're I'm jumping. turning over. Usually I like to be like alone and quiet and pretend I'm I'm naked snake sneaking in the jungle. But the more of this I play, the more I just want more opportunities to enjoy that slick ass gunplay. It's so good. Yeah, I, I feel like I, I – because it's so quick to find a match. And I want to carve my way through blood, you know? I want to feel like I earned it, you know? And once you, you go through a couple squads in the very beginning, you feel alive, you know? You're pumped. You're ready. Because um, I, I, I don't like sitting around for, like, 10 minutes not finding anyone. I – I don't want to do that sometimes. Sometimes it's okay, but I don't want to do that sometimes. You know, build up your your guy to like mega powerful stuff, and it, it's so unsatisfying when you you built up your character and all of a sudden you get jumped. Yeah, you just, you just you go through a door. They're waiting for you. They got toxic gas everywhere because you haven't unlocked the character yet, and you're just ah. And He's you're, fun. You're done. Um, Caust- I- Caustic's fun. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not doing Lifeline, I'm doing Caustic. The gas traps are too fun. His voice, his voice acting, um, his voice lines are probably the best. I am a man of silence. <laughs> I feel most alive when I'm approaching death yeah. or something like that when he's going down. It's so good. It's so good. Um, Mirage is also pretty cool. I, I, I really want to unlock him. I feel like paying money because I've been playing it a ton. But um, the no fall damage, the, the sliding, sliding is the best. Is the so sliding? Good. The I'll sliding? Like, <laughs> I like the no fall damage because it simulates horrible dreams I've had where I've woken up in the middle. I'm one of those falling dreams. It looks exactly like <laughs> if you look down when you jump off a cliff. <laughs> it's brilliant and yeah, it makes it you feel a bit sick. <laughs> yeah. I, I um, <laughs> The no team damage, except for like... Smoke. I think caustic. Yeah, the gas. Sm- yeah, so that that screwed us up yesterday. I I, I can uh, imagine George just throwing it down. Didn't exactly save the day. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He like this puts is... it down everywhere, and we're like, oh, George. Oh. This is a great example, actually. We had a house that was at the very middle of the last circle, with the last squad coming into our house, and I had gas traps in front of every single door, and we still they just. Ah. They damage the I, I team. I remember they do. They do. Mm. My team got mad at me because I put gas traps in front of. Them. Really? I could have sworn I've been in like a yeah, teammate's I gas so trap too. and been fine, but maybe not. Maybe I just wasn't noticing. I I think it affects you, but it might not damage. So that's what I wanted. Like it, that's my it, theory. I know it messes with the vision, and maybe it puts like a like it makes because I went in it and I felt like once I was taking damage, but I swore I looked at the health bar and it was fine. It might just negatively affect yeah. you. Yeah. Maybe. I might yeah, have to go back yeah. and have a look. Maybe so. you just like really to live like on the edge, Jim. Uh, You're just like, yeah, so maybe. Good. <laughs> I've certainly, I, I don't recall ever being chewed out for laying traps. Mm hmm. Yeah, I thought the same yeah, thing. It was, it yeah, it was a very specific situation. It was a very small house. We, we were all very cozy together. Mm hmm. Within, yeah. within touching distance. Nice little gift basket for the 20 teams that came in, the freaking. <sighs> Stick a pipe up the pig. <laughs> so, so hey, speaking of pigs that are getting way too fat and just blew up, uh, Liam, you still playing Kingdom Hearts? You still playing Kingdom Hearts? <laughs> well, s- settle in, guys. <laughs> I knew I've it. Got a tragi- I've got a tragic. I've got a tragic. Oh boy. No, 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 nothing. I was just, I was just gonna reminder that Kingdom Hearts is not so great because <laughs> I. I the reason why I put it on a timeline is because I looked up the Metacritic. I was like, let me look at the Metacritic story. And it's 85. It's an 85. An 85. An 85. <laughs> that last week, you had a gun to my head and was it's telling like me a- to say Kingdom Hearts 3 is great. So what changed? <laughs> 
this is like a Mass Effect 3 situation where I didn't like Mass Effect 3 and then, you know, everyone liked it. I don't think everybody likes it's Kingdom fine. Hearts. It's fine. I think the three people who've played it, because I know I watched Jim's uh, Jim Impressions video on it, and... I... Oh, what did you think, uh, As a game, I like it. As a story, I can't stand it. The <laughs> cutscenes make my head hurt. But I like the gameplay. I like the spectacle. Did you play the it. other ones? I played Kingdom Hearts 1. Loved that way back in the day. Played Kingdom Hearts 2. Yeah. That's where I started to lose all sense of it. But, I again, I enjoyed <laughs> it as a as an overall adventure. This one, um, you can tell a clear difference between what's been cribbed off actual writers at Disney and what's been taken that's from Matt's the problem. fever dreams of Square Enix. Yeah, that's that's my that's my huge problem. Like it, it's it's like some of them they had leeway to do stuff, and some of them they didn't. And it, most of it is just like you're just following the story of the Disney uh, of what whatever you saw in the movie, but they cut up like huge pieces of it. And I, it's kind of the same how Kingdom Hearts two and one did it. Sort of. I, I feel like it's a lot worse. It's and a reminder of how the industry, like games as an industry, needs more writers. It. Oh my gosh, Spider Man. Oh my gosh, Spider Man was so good. <laughs> okay. So, Wait, where did that's what I I want more Spider Man. Just <laughs> that's what I want because the writing in that was like superb. Just before we leave Kingdom Hearts, though, I've not, so we can let Matt yeah. fucking. No, no, no. It's fine. Spider-Man was good. You don't need... Go rent it. Go rent it for $4. But, they, well, yeah. depending on how you feel about it, then, this is either a tragic tale or it was a divine intervention from Dad. So, I, I, I you know, I've been playing through Kingdom Hearts 3 and I was enjoying my time with Resident Evil 2. <laughs> I got to, like, right. 20 hours in Kingdom Hearts 3. I was, like, about to go to the fucking Pirates of the Caribbean world that was the one I was looking forward to, right? And then... Yeah. That, that 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 sexy boy. And then, as we know on this show, the long-running standard is that my PlayStation 4 has not been very well. You said it sounded like a helicopter last yeah. time. Yeah. Mine's uh, been doing that. Where we're playing RE2. Well, my Jim, PS4's been making noise. Well, Jim, then mm -hmm. prepare. Th this, is, this is a warning. I'm your future dad. Ah, oh, I bloody knew it. <laughs> I'm your future dad because it mine usually takes like two times to boot. And it has done for like a year. Like it will like, it'll be like and it'll be like pew and shut down and then it'll reboot itself and then it'll be like here's an error report and I'll be like no it's fine we do this every time we dance this dance every time PlayStation and then it goes into the PS4 and it's fine and I can play yeah, it I've been suspecting mine's on the outs but I turned it on the other day and it booted into safe mode <laughs> It booted into fucking safe mode, and I was like, okay, there's, there's like five options, and one was restart, one was change resolution, I was like, okay. Uh, another change was, resolution? <laughs> yeah, so there was like restart, there was change resolution, there was update PlayStation 4, and then there was three other options. And first, I, I was like restarting it, and I, and then... It just would boot back into safe mode, and it would boot back into safe mode, and I googled it, and it was like the, uh, the dreaded safe mode loop, where you're basically stuck in this until you do some very forced change. So then I tried to update it, because maybe I needed updating. No, it was it was up to date, there was nothing I could do. And I tried to change the resolution, and that did nothing as well, as expected. As yeah, expected. Exactly. <laughs> um, so then my final three <laughs> options were... Restore default settings, initialize PS4, Ooh. or initialize PS4 mm. bracket data loss or something. And I was like, mm. well, all three of these things sound the fucking same, PlayStation. But you can't do the last one. A heart might be living there. Well, Jim, <laughs> that's what I thought as well. All those precious data oh, nobodies and data heartless. And I was like, well, do you know what? Okay, I need to get out of this loop. I'm going to go with what seems like the most innocent option, which would be restore default settings. Because the data on the PlayStation won't be lost, but I'll have to just re-sign into my profile and all my themes and all that will be gone. It's fine. Because initializing PS4 is having initialized dev kits for years. I know, I know exactly what that motherfucking option does. So I was like, well... that's Is that is that a soft reformat? No, initialize basically? PS4 is basically wipe it to new. 
Yeah, just, okay, so like a hard reformat. Oh, it's a hard reformat. Mm -hmm. Whereas a restore default settings is like a soft, is a softer one. Well, I'm, I'm a bit confused about the difference between initialize PS4 and initialize PS4 data loss. Yeah, me too. That's why I was like, I ain't touching those options. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and all three of these options seem the same. So I went with what seemed like the softest, and I was like, okay, gambare, come on. Oh, oh no. So I did it. It reset itself, and then it it, it booted up normally. It didn't ha even have an error, which was like a first. And then it was like, user one. And I was like, ah, shit, my profile's gone. Okay, that's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Set up my profile again. It's fine. Got in the game, went straight to data storage, and all of my games were still there. All of my game data and everything was still on the PlayStation 4. I'm at the edge of my seat. I know how it ends. And, and then how we get there. I scrolled down to save data. <laughs> and it was like, save data, zero kilobytes. Oh. Okay, Liam. PlayStation Plus. Everything. Everything. God. I, and yes. Yes. Okay. I get it. You can pay money to have cloud saves yes. on PlayStation Plus. And I used to have PlayStation Plus. So, like... Previous games I've been playing, like God of War and Spider-Man and all that kind of stuff, I think there's cloud saves somewhere for me. But you got to pay the piper to get them now. But, Matt, yep. my 20 hours that I invested in that shitty-ass oh, Disney no. World is gone. <laughs> <laughs> the fever dream. Which one? Which one was shitty? Just, Which just one? like, not that it was shitty... Wait, was it was it Toy Story? Yeah, I mean, Toy Story's Story is the reason I won't replay it because fuck doing that shit again. <laughs> you want you don't want to save the pig again? I don't want to go to like five different toy stores and fight the same enemies again. No, twenty hours of Kingdom Hearts gone. This was like the first time I was ever gonna finish a Kingdom Hearts game. I truly was like Jim. Ignoring all story elements and just playing the game and having a fairly decent time of it. And now that will never happen because there is no fucking way I'm replaying that 20 hours. So those extra 20 hours is going to be like added to your brain, right? So if you replay it again, it's going to be 21, even though you're playing Stop the it, first Matt. hour of the game. And you're going to notice that you you keep pressing the same button Stop. over Stop and over it. again. Stop over it. and over again. Oh, what, what, where? Magic? <laughs> no. <laughs> Smash. But that's the thing is, Smash. I lost my Smash. Resident Evil 2 it's... save as well. Like, I lost my Leon A and my Claire B run. And I was like, do you know uh, what? Well, th I'm okay those, with that. I'm going to play fine, that game actually. again. I'm yes, fine yes. with that. But Kingdom Hearts, 20 hours, gone. Never, ever going to play that again. Look up the ending on YouTube. Do you even care enough to look up the ending on YouTube? I already looked up the secret ending because I was like, well... <laughs> oh, you've already... Okay. Well, I guess that answers that. I would be very careful about such things. Oh, re oh, wait. You didn't finish it? Jim, did you finish it? Oh, I got way too busy. Apex Legends came yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you didn't... Oh, you didn't finish it. Okay. Yeah, that... I did, like, enough okay. to do, like, my, like, Jim Impressions video. And then did another world... Like, did, I think I did another two worlds after that. And then... Other games happened, and I had to just move on. Other better games. Speaking oh. of other better games, I started a third playthrough <laughs> of RE2 last night, and I, I am loving that game yeah. better and better every time. Yeah, you see, like, my data loss, my save data loss of that game, not so tragic. It, it really, I think, my grow into one of my big favorites like the level of interaction that you have with each individual zombie is is real real nice it, it reminds me of how much you could do with each individual zombie in re4 yeah. it wasn't just a resident evil 2 remake it was it's a straight up horror game in its own right from the ground up yeah. and, and it weirdly plays more like dead space uh once you figure out yeah. the damage model yeah somewhat you uh you aim for the limbs instead, and then um, <laughs> like point them in the wrong direction, and then run the other way. And uh, it's it's also real fun how much faster and smoother, and also not scary, but still satisfying in an action game sense with like good game feel and good sense of control it gets on those second runs. The the spooks are not there anymore, but I'm still like I could not pull myself away. I was still completely. Uh, immersed in in the struggle and the planning of uh, having to to 
map out a route in my head and stick to a plan and then panic when things go wrong and, and a zombie won't die the way I want it to or Mr. X will show up and block the path. Like, there's an element of strategy and tactics to it even. RE4 that... did that similarly where I, I played through it so many times and it stopped being scary, especially by the time you've got, you know... Um, is her name Ash? I forget the the Ashley. president's daughter. Ashley, yeah. Once you've got her in yeah. a suit of armor and you're walking around with your Chicago typewriter, there's no there's nothing <laughs> scary about it anymore. But it was yeah. still just really fun to play through. Yeah, and and whenever whenever you decide to. Uh blast your ps4 with some compressed air cross your fingers and and make an offering to the divine dad uh you're 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 gonna have a blast with those replays like it's it's i don't want to say it's like more fun the second time it's just kind of as fun because now i know the rules of the game and and i feel like i'm playing a a convoluted action game rather than a convoluted horror game and i love how uh how how the good Resident Evils throughout the whole franchise have always embraced that transformation of going from like a scared babby to a div- beautiful warrior, and and the fact that I'm seeing it here, I feel like this one's really doing something right. It's a, I feel like this one's gonna be remembered. It's a damn good game. Yeah, yeah. Ugh. I agree. They, I when they make, I was talking about this with someone yesterday. When they make or they remake Resident Evil Three, what they've learned from this excursion into remaking RE2. Like, the stuff they can carry over into Resident Evil 3 remake. Ah! It's gonna be good. So, Matt, I saw that you jotted down on the outline that you wanted to talk about the Nintendo Direct. Yeah, well, I just, basically I just wanted to mention Hollow Knight. Oh, yeah. Which wasn't part of the Nintendo Direct. (laughs) It wasn't. It wasn't. So I mentioned it first. (laughs) Hollow Knight's Silk Song. It's it's, it's been a big day. We're we're recording this on on the 14th, and the Direct was yesterday. Apex Legends was was hitting it big like two days earlier. A fuck ton happened, like within the past 48 hours. I don't envy doing Jim's job this week. I haven't stopped. It's been a... We were trying to do a site relaunch at the same time, which hasn't happened yet because that hit a load of roadblocks and i also thought i'll get into long form writing again after a, like a year and change away um i made loads of extra work for myself and then loads of stuff happened on top of it but it keeps me busy <laughs> so so speaking of being busy and stressed and taking big loads <coughs> um let's do it 10 minute nintendo direct talk uh uh, uh i i like link's awakening i'm looking forward to that. that's that's Cute. The art style looks oh, fantastic. God, yeah, that looks yeah. nice. Speaking of remakes, <laughs> that good kick. Mm. Have Have you guys uh, uh, tried Tetris ninety nine? Yeah. No. Wait, wait, uh, wait. What, what, yeah, what, what, Jim. Uh, yeah. Jim, How I, do you feel about it? Because I know what's coming from you. Oh. Don't say anything, I, George. I oh. tweeted. I tweeted before I played. Right. Finally got time to try this Tetris ninety nine. Uh huh. About ten minutes later, I tweeted. Well, done that. <laughs> That's what I think of Tetris 99. <laughs> and are you done with it? Or do you do you do you think you're gonna pick it up again? I ever? immediately put Apex back on, and I think I'm all okay. right sticking with Apex. I I I fuck. <laughs> I hate Tetris 99. Let, get, okay, so I never played it, so tell me why. Okay, so the way it works is that you have 99 people playing Tetris all at once, and there's some uh, incorporation of, of multiplayer competitive battle Tetris involved, where uh, every time you either clear four lines or do combos, it starts sending chunks of junk to the other player. Oh, no. And you use your analog sticks to basically slide a cursor across a huge grid displaying every single player's game to pick a quote-unquote target. Uh, that you're going to send your junk lines to. And there's... The thing that was pissing me off so much last night is that I love Tetris. I get hooked on Tetris real easy. If I pick up a good copy of Tetris, I don't want to put it down quickly. And so I I took a legit stab at trying to figure this thing out, and, and the way it works legitimately made me mad. <laughs> I could not find... Maybe I'm getting something wrong, but I could not find for the life of me... I can't underest... I can't, like, understate... Just how angry George was. <laughs> I could not get to sleep last night because <laughs> I was l- lying around in my bed playing this Tetris attack. 
uh, Tetris, not Tetris, Tetris 99, like, like being like, okay, it's just some cozy switch bed gaming. But then I would like lie awake <laughs> thinking about it. So the thing is, is that it doesn't seem like there's a counterbalancing oh mechanic to prevent multiple players from targeting one player. I felt pretty bullied a few <laughs> times playing it. Dogpiling. Yeah, there's, and it's, it's almost random since every player is completely anonymous and no one knows who else is targeting anyone else. There's just like a dice roll. Uh, it's up to, to the dad in the sky whether or not you're going to get dogpiled on. When you do, <laughs> you are supposed to start clearing out little bits of line really, really fast to uh, counter the junk coming to you. But it's Tetris. Like there is a true statistical chance of the, the pieces that are dropping that there's going to be like a good... Um, two to three drops where you're not going to be able to clear lines because of the, the order and the randomization of, of the blocks it's giving you. I don't know if you guys know this, but in Tetris, uh, it simulates the idea of all those blocks being inside of a bag. It goes through a rotation of them and then resets them. So you're always going to be due for an L line um, if you've not seen an L line for a while. And the, the problem is that if you set yourself up for Tetrises, then you're going to have downtime where you can't clear out smaller lines at a time. But if you all of a sudden panic and need to because you see a whole lot of junk coming your way, <laughs> then you're setting yourself up for failures to not get more Tetrises later on. And it's counterintuitive. It's hostile. I never panic when I see junk come in my way. Oh, uh, uh, oh, oh. Well, well, you haven't played enough Tetris 99 then. And I never will. Yeah, I think I'll avoid this one. George, are you going to like sadistically force yourself to go back? That's the worst part of it, you guys. That is the worst part of it. Is that I really want to win so one. Predictable. Yes, yes. I'm a competitive asshole sometimes, especially when it comes to things I hate. And so I even the very first match I played of, of Tetris 99, I think I did make it in the top 15. The second match I made in the top 10. Like I am I feel like I'm doing things right. But once you get to that point, the speed of the game increases as as more players drop out. It increases the level of, of Tetris, which basically means how fast the blocks go down. And since there's going to be 10 players left and since there's a random chance they could dogpile one, that one player is just Fuck. Maybe someone can explain to me how you're supposed to react enough, but in the later stages of a, of a match at Tetris 99, the blocks are falling so fast that if someone gets dogpiled on by one of those good players who can last long enough and constantly clear out lines and send junk to the other players, and if they have multiple players targeting them at that late level, they are just fucked. There's nothing you can do to react to it that fast. It's like... Okay, I mean... <sighs> I'm going to play more. Maybe I'll be real embarrassed of this podcast next week when I figure it out. And But that's the worst part of it, is that there's still like this addictive element, oh, this hook to it that makes me want to figure it out. <laughs> I can't believe how angry you got about Tetris. <laughs> I, just, I just, just don't know anymore, Dad. Dude, <laughs> uh, you get angry about some funny things. Tetris. I got really angry about the RE2 demo having a one play. Hey, Jim, you're a man of the people, right? Mm -hmm. You're 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 the, like a t I can't believe we're bringing this back up. You're 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 like a a, a town crier who is um um st sticking up for the vox populi as as shitty news comes in from from the higher. What did you think of the Resident Evil 2 demo's uh, one play limit restriction? I hadn't thought about it to be honest. Uh <laughs> 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 okay, fine. That's it. We're going to break. We're going Good. To break. Good. Break. <laughs> <laughs> Over here, Boglin. Me and my buddies need a place to hide out. <laughs> Come a little closer. <laughs> oh, did I scare you? Oh, I do that so well. If you take us home, we'll kiss your aunt Martha. <laughs> we'll eat your peas. And we hope you know lots of girls. Hey, the name's Bob Let's each sold separately, and we're looking for good homes. Maybe yours. <laughs> And we are back. Unfortunately, Matt Visual had to leave for work, but we still have Jim Sterling, Liam Edwards, and myself to talk about this week's big news story, which, again, I bet Jim Sterling might be tired of, of hearing about by now. But. I know, right? <laughs> Kingdom Hearts cutscenes include software watermark due to DRM <laughs> issues. You... I love you. Okay, so yeah, I, I haven't seen Jim Sterling talk a lot about this one. I don't know if you've seen this story, but... but 
<laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna post us some screenshots. Uh, people who are listening, these are gonna be in the descriptions. But there are a few frames of Kingdom Hearts three where fans have spotted the word Arnold showing up. <laughs> like Elsa's over here waving her arms in front of the mountains, and her sleeve just says Arnold on it. She's just conjuring up Arnold magic. The reasoning being is that uh, Square Enix's rendering farms apparently were having um, authentication issues. Every time they render a single frame of these pre-rendered cutscenes, the uh, software checks in with an authentication server for DRM purposes and applies the Arnold watermark, because Arnold's the name of the software, onto the frame. And it's... I mean, it's a hilarious goof, but at the same time, it's also an interesting look at game development, how they... You know, I've had problems with watermarks and videos and DRM and login issues, and, and they're, you know, for all, all the news we, we hear, sometimes you get a reminder that they're not so different from, from the rest of us. I think I think this new story's kind of cute. They make mistakes. Yeah. yeah. They make mistakes. You sounded like you were going to explain who Ansem was then. <laughs> You see, his nobody and his heartless <laughs> split off into Terra's and then a heart. Oh, oh. Do I? His real name was Arnold. <laughs> Do I turn into Mickey Mouse when I'm like exasperated and out of breath? Oh God! Oh jeez. <laughs> okay. Um. Anyways, yeah. Apparently, there is a option you can tick to uh, 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 warn your developers if, if there's server authentication issues when it tries to render a frame that they forgot to tick. But when the, it's, this is the kind of thing that when you look at the frame, it looks like a really, really glaring goof. But since it is only like two frames between three video games, or. It doesn't yeah, matter. It, I, I'm, I am okay with this. This, this... I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a long-ass RPG with so many cutscenes in And two it. frames that say Arnold. And two frames that say Arnold. Yeah, yeah, so... Uh, it's fine. I, I, you I, say I, that I... now until they find a cock and balls in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's accidental. Someone's placeholder art. I, I would like to share this... <laughs> just no more, just drew like a cock and balls on a piece of paper and it somehow ended up in there. What if it's like on a single frame of Mickey Mouse's mouth? Oh, you had to go there. Yeah. Speaking of like putting your dick in people's mouths and fucking them over. Oh my god. Well, that's what Bobby Kodak likes to do. Yeah, yeah, this is this is the gym topic. Activision Blizzard laid off hundreds, estimated to be around uh, 800 people. They reported that it was 8% of its staff, and if they have 9,600 employees, that's how the math turns out. This is something that was... Predicted, leaked a day ahead of time. Uh, Bloomberg had anonymous sources saying this was going to happen, and it sure did on an investor call on Tuesday. Uh, Bobby Kotick reported that the company had once again achieved record results in 2018, but that the company would be consolidating and restructuring because of mixed expectations for 2018 and lowered expectations for 2019, which has always weirded me out because every time I look at their financial reports, they constantly brag about how they're breaking records. And, and that's the thing, right? You would think that like constantly doing a little better every single year would, would be sustainable for carrying people's jobs over time. Well, well, you know, um, we're in a position where you can rake in record revenue, still lose money, um, still see the value of your company half because um, you've enjoyed six years of completely unsustainable, rapid growth um, that you just can't support long term um, and put yourself in a position where shareholders expect you to be better than ever, which means you've got to constantly break records. So the one year you don't break a record, which is going to happen eventually um, because you can't, there's no such thing as infinite growth and infinite money and infinite audience. Uh, you find yourself in trouble and you find yourself in the position they're in right now um and what one would what one should reasonably expect in the world is for the people who are in charge to pay for it to pay for whatever damage they've caused as leaders as captains of the ship um you don't see that instead you see the buck pass to those on the lowest rungs of the ladder um and if that sounds if it sounds unreasonable for me to suggest that maybe the man worth seven billion dollars um should be able to stump up some of his own cash to solve this situation that he as the one in charge oversaw um 
just take a look at Nintendo. You will hear Satoru Iwata's name come up a lot uh, over the next few days and probably have already heard it the past few days um, because yeah. not once but twice uh, Satoru Iwata's taken a 50% pay cut to avoid layoffs, which he wanted to do because he doesn't feel, or didn't rather, um, you know, rest in peace, didn't uh, feel that mass layoffs were good for a company. Um Admitting that they, yeah. they're okay for short-term gains, but long-term, it's 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 not a healthy business model. Um, there is a big difference between here in Japan and there uh, with employment laws. Absolutely. And sort of in Japan's hierarchical system of lot. companies existing for years and years and years. A lot more job security. There's a lot more job security. And also, companies are nationally disgraced when oh, sure, yeah. stuff like this happens. Because Japan... Because Japan exists on an island on its own. It has done for years and years and years. And yeah, companies like Nintendo obviously publish and sell games worldwide. But for Nintendo internally in Japan, if they had laid off hundreds of people, it would have been a national disgrace. Yeah. They would have been they would have been destroyed. And you saw that with Konami. A lot of Japanese fans got as mad as Western fans. Yeah. That doesn't take away from what Iwata did, though, because he personally spoke about... How having this sort of stress over like a developer's head and like the fear that they might lose their job yeah. is going to, of course, negatively affect how they output at the company. They're not going to make good games. They're not going to do good work if they have like, oh, shit, I, I might get fired next month kind of going on. I'll be talking about this a bit on next Monday's Doomquisition. I wrote the script today. It was obviously about these layoffs. Um, and I brought up, you know, Iwata and a whole bunch of other points. Um, but yeah, like... like that is a big part of it is Nintendo as a company or certainly its executives know the concept, understand the concept and feel the concept of shame. Whereas the executives here, um, executives at Activision Blizzard, Bobby Kotick in particular, is a complete stranger to shame, it seems. Um, he has had fights with people over employee rights. He has joked during the economic crisis, no less, in the late 2000s, that if he could get away with it, he'd be charging more for games. He said about how he's only interested in intellectual IP that he can exploit for 10 years. Um, and he says this with no shame. And it's not right, but in this economic system, it is right in quotes, for him to behave that way. It's good business sense. Yeah, Bobby Kotick is behaving the right way for the system he's operating in. It's just the system is fucked. Yeah, just a, a little <laughs> bit where the engine's fucked. Um, so yeah, he's, he's doing everything right, but it's all wrong. And... Ultimately, <laughs> in a reasonable world, you would expect the people who, you know, crash the car to pay for the damage. But in this so instance, it's more like the kids who are in the back of the car have to pay. Strengthen layoff laws and uh, tax the rich. Just like hiring somebody, paying them like a million dollar salary and giving them a 15 million stock option bonus as a sign on is fucking mad when you're about to lay off 800 people. Just It's one rule for fucked. them and another rule for the rest. It's so fucked. I don't yeah. understand it. And bear in mind, these people are already in that executive hierarchy, which means they have either been given in bonuses or straight up inherited. Because I think in this at this time, I think 60% of all major wealth is inherited, I think. I know it was 40% uh, a while back, but it's a lot. So they they're but basically they are already mega rich. They are already so well off, they will never need more money again. For some reason, they don't have trouble finding jobs, and normal people really do. No, I mean, a parachute made of gold apparently works better than any canvas. So, yeah, they, they, again, well, I, I mentioned John Riccitello. Still a CEO. Yeah. Still a CEO. Um, these guys award themselves massive amounts of money um, because that is, of course, all the business is to them. And it doesn't matter if it's video games. It doesn't matter if it's any other company. Um, I believe it was Bobby Kotick who like started at Pepsi or something. It doesn't matter what the industry is. 
So long as there's money. Well, they, they don't come from games. No, 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 not at all. In Japan, it's like kind of the opposite, right? Yeah. Like, like they are former developers who oh, yeah. work their way up. Let it not be forgotten that Shigeru Miyamoto took a pay cut as well at that time. Yeah. yeah. Like, this is this is a very stark difference. Like, like not wishing the, 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 <laughs> the mortal demise of anybody at all. But if, per se, Bobby Kotick was to pass away... There would be not a thought or care in the world. He just needs to be fired. He should be fired. Whereas Iwata was like, he was a CEO. He was there to make money. But the outpouring of love and support and just general fondness for him as the human being and game developer he was on top of being a CEO... I'm not gonna. Is... I'm not gonna do that. The contrast between the alive and the dead. I've been in that position <laughs> yeah. where friends of mine have died in in the business, and people have wished it was me instead. Um, yeah. But I will say it's it's criminal that Iwata passed and Kotick has a job. Yes. <laughs> Dad works in delirious ways. <laughs> George, how come you haven't used your powers to get him fired yet? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I sacrifice pipe pigs every other dad day and, and it's still not happening. I don't know. Should I, should I start like sacrificing unsold Wii U's? Conics are turd with dead eyes and it's those dead eyes that make it look like he's wearing a human skin suit. <laughs> I could sacrifice false eyeballs. I might watch that Moneyball film soon just so I can see him on screen and boo him and throw things at the TV. Boo. Wait, was Bobby Kotick in a movie? Yeah. He had a cameo in Moneyball, yeah. Why? I want to hear what his voice sounds like, actually. I think it was uh, it was an actual connection. It was he knew someone or like had some funding involved in the film or something. Trust him to be involved in a fucking film called Moneyball. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, oh. right. That makes it even even slimier. You'd think he'd be the, the title character. <laughs> well, he is this week. <laughs> Bobby Kotick's Moneyballs. Um, anyways, I'm just going to jot that down in a notepad file some way and file it away. Um, <laughs> I'm going to move us on to the next segment of our show here. This is an audience participation game show called Dad Den. Speaking of uh, dicking people over and stealing their ideas. Yes, yes. Dad Den is based off of a TV show called Dragon's Den. Uh, in America, it was marketed as Shark Tank, in which audience members pitch business ideas to, uh, you know, wealthy investors such as us for uh, our, <laughs> our input on their ideas and whether or not we should, we should give them absolute untold millions of, of George Bucks. Huge disclaimer this week. Very, like, going forward, huge disclaimer. Uh, now it's officially announced, I have a new job and... I'm going to be working at Q Games here in Japan as a game designer. If, for any reason, one of these ideas formulates somehow into a game at Q Games, you can't blame me. Disclaimer. Oh my Continue god, do I have to email my lawyers now? <laughs> so, for our first submission, we have a game from Andrew P, who submits Bump in the Night. Bump in the Night. The idea for this game would be that you and your friends are hunting monsters. Each level you choose to play would have different monsters associated with it. These monsters wouldn't be like Monster Hunter monsters. They would be normie monsters, like a werewolf, a wendigo, or the Jersey Devil. Once you start the game, you would need to find out where the monster rests, what its patrol patterns are like, what damages it, since not all monsters are weak to the same stuff, while gathering supplies and weapons and setting up traps. Each level would be a different environment, like a ghost town or abandoned camping site. No level would be anything bigger than a dishonored level, but it would be packed with stuff to scavenge and several pieces of the environment to interact with. There would be one monster for each level, though the monster would be random, so you don't get the same monster in the same environment every time. Then... <laughs> I like how they write, then you know, you would fight the monster and hopefully you would win. <laughs> then you could start a new game in a new environment against a new monster and fun times would be had by all. Uh, they're imagining an art style similar to Left 4 Dead, a little stylized so interactive doodads and pieces of the environment are going to be easily noticeable, and they estimate a budget that would be roughly $4 million USD with a time budget of two years. Uh, good on you, Andrew P., because um, then they threw in, Google says the average game developer makes $83,000 a year, and a scrappy team of 15 or so for two years would cost around $3 million, Wait, and then add in the rest of the money for server space, and then come over $4 million. Hmm. $83,000's a... So this money. is kind of just that like dollar bin store monster engine hunter. programmers and stuff. 
<laughs> well, but dollar bit. D- these are real monsters that exist in the real world. Yeah, gnomey monsters. Like the Jersey Devil. Like the werewolf. Nor- yeah. <laughs> like a werewolf. <laughs> Uh, or or th- <laughs> that pig that got stuck on the pipe and got mad about it. <laughs> gas pig. The fa- the famous monster gas pig. Jim, how are you feeling? How does this sound to you? Well, as a venture capitalist, <laughs> <laughs> with my big cigar and my company called Big <laughs> Company. I knew this would be good. Sitting on my millions and millions of dollars. That, that, you know, you don't want to toss out, spare, uh, uh, profusely, yeah. pr- promiscuously, so to speak. I'm looking at this idea. I'm loving the monsters. I'm loving the dungeons. <laughs> Is that it? Like, that, that, that's Is that, <laughs> you, you, you just get the piece of paper, yes? and you're just like, ah, these monsters here, I love these monsters. I don't know. I, I was working at Baker King. <laughs> then I got fired, and now I'm the CEO of a games company. <laughs> I rec- what I mean to say is I recognize the Woids monster and dungeon. <laughs> so I say sign off on it. Four, four million, you're all right with that? Four million, I'll tell the shareholders we expect to sell ten million copies. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that green light. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because if we don't hit 10 million, we can just fire 50% of the workforce. Yeah, how many how many employees did this guy say he was hiring this, this scrappy dev team? We'll uh, scrap that 15? dev team if this fucks up. <laughs> but the team's already scrappy. <laughs> <laughs> well, those guys have 2 years to make this game otherwise Jim's going to fire them. Uh, this is a game idea I've actually wanted to see for a while, like Monster Hunter, but with with re- real monsters. They could call it, ah, real monsters. <laughs> You've been waiting all episode to say that, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's why the, the monsters are highlighted in green. <laughs> They're normie monsters. <laughs> and then for some reason, ah, normie monsters doesn't have quite the same kick to it. Ah! Uh, this could just be DLC for Monster Hunter. One thing that I don't know, though, is the idea of making it a Left 4 Dead style game. I feel like just shooting the monster not, in the no, face. No, 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 that's the art style. That's the art style. Oh, oh, okay. That's the art style. Okay, let's just make sure we're a little more interesting than, than shooting no, the real monster. Let me break it down face. for you. I, I just yeah? consulted with the marketing team. They got back from a focus group. Yeah. We make it a multiplayer fast. experience. <laughs> Everybody gets to play an ah real monster. <laughs> There's a hundred players. The, They're dropped the into a giant tongue. ass dungeon. <laughs> and they fight until there's only one left. There's one there's one hundred werewolves. Apparently there's a gap in the market for that sort of game. And it's really yeah. popular. I'll tell the investors Apex. we'll sell 20 million copies. And look at how well Apex is doing. All we have to do is follow follow the proven reliable formula. We'll just do exactly what... Let's call it Apex Legends. <laughs> we'll sell 30 million copies. If they don't, we'll buy another company and fire everybody working there. That'll upset the loss. No, we have to call it Apex Legends Bump in the Night Royale. Ah, real Apex Legends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, it sounds like Jim's in. Jim, Jim can give him the four million. I can't fucking breathe, you guys. <laughs> <coughs> right. Nor can I. It's fifty years of cigarettes and cholesterol. <laughs> it's all those I money mean, balls you keep chewing. Fifty years worth of cigarettes. That that adds up. That's an expensive hobby. Uh, so congratulations, Andrew P. You did it. <laughs> I, I think you got Jim Sterling to invest in your game. Congratulations. <laughs> Next up, we have a submission from Ziggity Zoggity. Ziggity Zoggity submits a game called Midnight Runner. Royale. Uh, Midnight. Min- <laughs> no, just I, we haven't meddled yet. <laughs> Midnight Runner is a VR first person getaway driver game. Emphasis on no hand holding and no HUD pushing immersion. You put your respective VR goggles on and start the game, and you're going to be in a driver's seat of a nondescript four-door sedan staring down at your phone in your right hand, which is a mini-map. 
uh, with a, a, a schmoogle schmaps directing you. There's no traditional <laughs> HUD, no tips or tutorials popping up, but you do get a parking lot driving test that you can get acquainted with the physics and controls with without the game punishing you for fucking up before you make it to the getaway meetup spot and the screen flashes white, at which point you suddenly have to make it to one of three meetup spots designated on your smartphone, but this time it's just a snapshot of the destination instead of full directions. You're on your own on this one. The passengers don't speak, maybe look out the windows every now and then. You just have to avoid the law and make it to the drop point. The graphics are going to be a super hot level geometry style, but with more realistic colors, like as as if it's an Unreal Engine 3 game where all the all the all the textures haven't loaded in yet for a few frames after the, the loading screen. Graphics are going to be like totally accurate battlegrounds, but with more emphasis on atmosphere and less reliant on goofy models. It takes place at night, sometimes with rain, sometimes without. They're going to be budgeting $300,000 at two years for this. What do we think? Well, first off, how could you have like super hot level geometry with realistic colors if it takes place at night and with rain? I, 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 I'm imagining like gray, wet streets with angular lines of neon lights on buildings. And that's kind of how you like figure out okay. what, what direction, you need, mm. where, where the walls are, mm. is, is, is reflections and light play. Maybe that's not quite what they're picturing, though. Okay. I'll let that one but, slide. But I do like, I do really, really like the idea of a VR getaway cop chase. I would, I, I would enjoy it. It'll just like load up Vorpex on GTA Five, set it to first person mode, and and feel what the, what 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 it feels like in the car cockpit. And uh, could I just say cockpit for a car? <gasps> oh, silly me. The cabin. It does sound um, like a good idea. Like it, it generally sounds like a fun gameplay idea. Although, it says. Uh, the other, you're on your own, the passengers don't speak. But I mean, it would be better if they did speak. And they told you little tidbits, like, if you go around the fast food joint, I, I hear, like, like if you had environmental hints from the passengers' passage, it, like with Apex Legends, where you have tiny little bits of communication fed to you. I'm just, I'm just wondering if it would be weird hearing human voices on top of, like, super hot style art. Would it be weird to have done a bank robbery and for those guys not to be freaking out? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, unless the stylization shows them as like uh, slick professionals who are, are cold, cold-hearted sociopaths who don't want to talk, just want to do the job and get out. Well, at the end of the day, we are just not qualified enough, George. Jim Moneybag Sterling, the CEO of our company. A big company. Of our big company. What, what are we doing? I'm going to level with you, shorty. There ain't no money in VR no more. <laughs> However, something did pique my interest. Can you go back to the pitch there, Georgie? <sighs> VR first person getaway yeah, driver read the game. Whole thing again. Just <laughs> emphasis. Uh, tell oh, me oh, the oh, oh. tell me the bit again about a totally accurate. And he said something about it being totally accurate. What? What yeah, part yeah, the, was the that? Graphics, the graphics would be similar to to another video game called Totally Accurate. But you, you, you know, <laughs> totally accurate. What? The, yeah, b Battlegrounds. Ah, it's, it's, it's a new genre cooking of video with game. Gas. Oh, yes, yes, Battle yes. Battlegrounds, I know that word. <laughs> yeah. So I yeah. tell you what we're gonna do. Everybody plays as a car <laughs> with a cockpit. <laughs> They're dropped into this gigantic street. There's a hundred of them. And they crash into each other until there's only one left. It, this started out sarcastically, but I think I just had a legitimately <laughs> great idea. Make that game... And I say we ship it. Do you think we can make it with only three hundred thousand dollars? Totally accurate parking lot simulator royale. Battlegrounds. <laughs> Libertarian traffic law simulator. Don't ask me to come up with a name for it. I'm an executive. I'm not in the business of being creative. <laughs> there's, there's too many good, good names for a game where cars just smush into each other in a giant parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> a metaphor for the human condition: colon the game. And only one can survive. Wait, or, or we could make it so one has to go to the uh, designated smartphone spot. And then waves to come and destroy them. Like I've, I don't think uh, that system belongs in any other game. Like a giant destructive wave that you have to always run away from. 
Never heard of that. It would be probably more fun to drive away from it, actually. Um, I, I do really like the, the gimmick of the uh, photograph you have to match up with uh, your your face on your phone. Yeah, that, that's why having, like, passengers have little tidbits of, like about locations that you drive past. But that also could be incorporated at the VR mechanics, like holding a photo up in front of your face and then, like, moving your head around it to see if it matches up with whatever street you're on. I think that's the general I, I don't idea, think yeah, but you need a little more information yeah, to go yeah. on, otherwise you're just going to be driving around a map until you have memory of it. Maybe it depends on how well the art style is. I, 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 I like it. Well, a lot of it's going to be indistinct. I like driving in VR. It's a hell of a lot of fun driving in VR, and there aren't a lot of good VR cop chasing games. You yet. just like VR. And I just like VR. Don't undersell it. $300,000 for any VR game. There, you, you wanted a PSVR headset for Christmas. I did. But then I lost all my saves, and I lost everything. <laughs> I lost everything. And now you just... Oh, uh, you've been... You've been, like, defeated by the system f f failing, literally. I know. And the CEO of this company is not allowing me to make my masterpiece. Fortnite. He just doesn't think it's a good idea. Ain't no one's playing Fortnite, kid. There's, there's no money in Fortnite, <laughs> apparently. There's no money in Fortnite no more. <laughs> it's all... It's, it's, it's all Anthem if now. They, I think for three hundred thousand dollars, like not two years though, maybe a year. I can't. Yeah, if they're sticking with the super hot art style, that's not a very demanding one. They like like you make some real fun prototypes real fast and release something quick and dirtier than maybe what they're thinking of. Mm. Hmm. You'd run out of budget quite fast, I think. Two years at three hundred thousand, maybe. Yeah, but one year. It, well, actually, come to think of it, that's yeah, that's that's just what you said. So I think maybe we're maybe we're we're in agreement here. Maybe we think this could work. Well, it depends. Is it a one-person team or a two-person team? Because if the average is 83K, which is wildly more than, yeah. I think, um, yeah, that's like, well, that would be 160 a year. That's programmer money. So you're, all, you're, you're already over your budget for two years. Unless we unless we, we have two and then fire one of them after a year. How ironic is it, then, that it seems like we need to expand the budget? Hmm? Oh, yeah, hmm. well, we just need to we gotta just fire people. We just need to fire people. Just be warned, and I'm going to drop the voice now because it was only vaguely funny once, let alone three times. You can expand <laughs> the budget, but then you have to literally tell the shareholders that it's going to sell more as a result. Yeah. And VR getaway driving games where you, like, drive away from cops and do socially heinous stuff is probably not going to be a super mainstream popular game. And then again, we do live in a world where Grand Theft Auto exists, so... But but VR games are not going to be... VR games are not going to recoup investors, like, like flatline expectations. They're for selling... At least on the PSVR world, they're like first-party deals for selling the hardware more so than the copies of I the mean, game itself. I mean, they're not asking for three million. Like three hundred thousand is not a hard budget to expand upon in reality. I wonder how First Contact got their money for uh, uh, Firewall Zero Hour. Anyways, I would, I would, uh, Midnight Runner sounds good. Sounds good to me. The budget scares me though. I think, I think they got that wrong. I think they got it wrong, but I think it's a realistic enough budget that you could expand upon it in reality. Whereas if it was three million, maybe a bit too much. I, I, I'd put money forward yeah. to see to to get it started, get you those know, prototypes I'm, out there. I'm wishy washy on this one. You're the VR guy. I know, but but for three hundred, th why do I care about imaginary money so much? It's you, George. Yeah, you it's care about me. a lot of imaginary things. Jim Sterling, do you like Ziggity Zaggity's idea? I'm putting all my money into Battle Rolls Royce. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a game I can invest in. -um so, speaking of investing in things, uh, for the two people who don't know who you are, Jim Sterling, where should they invest your time to learn more? Um, or invest their time? They, yeah, my time's all my time spoken yeah, yeah, for. No, sorry. I, um, <laughs> Uh, I would say that they could look at me on the internet if they want. It's up to them. It's their choice. Just look at you. It's a buyer's market. Uh, they can <laughs> go and check me out on YouTube, Jim Sterling. It's just YouTube.com, your, your little forward slashy there, and then Jim Sterling. Uh, same goes on Twitter, at Jim Sterling. Um, I do a weekly show. That's my main thing. I do a lot of stuff throughout the week, but my main show is every Monday called The Jimquisition. You check out the Jim Sterling YouTube on a Monday morning, you'll see something. Um, 
usually about the business side of games uh, and my opinions thereof. And if you end up liking that, I've got a Patreon page, uh, Jimquisition, patreon.com forward slash Jimquisition. Uh, I think it's that, unless it's the Jimquisition. Yes. I'm terrible at marketing. Well, <laughs> it's Jim position on its own. There we are. You could never be the CEO. Good, good, good thing I'm around because I was just about to ask if um, there's some other content of yours. Like you were talking about how you wanted to get into long form writing. If there's um, stuff you're putting out these days that's not as well known as the Jim Quisition that you're like really excited and hopeful for. Like, like, uh, are there any topics you're really looking forward to digging into with your writing now, um, or anything you want to promote that might be um, flying under? Yeah, I mean, I, I published an article this week on the Jimquisition.com. That one does have a the in it. Um, we can't do Jimquisition.com because at one point a hentai site had that domain. Um, yeah, I don't think it's that anymore, but don't try nice. if you're at work. Uh, TheGymQuisition.com, if you go there. Um, I used to do a lot of long-form writing, but I um, took a long break from it for personal reasons. Went back into it this week, and hopefully I can do them more. But yeah, there's an article called How Apex Legends Saved EA's Ass uh, in Spite of EA, which talks about various factors that went into Apex Legends' success um, and how the one thing that was uh, the the biggest thing that uh, s that made Apex Legends a success is that EA was wrong about it. Um, so EA's ass was saved this quarter, um, unlike Activision, because Apex Legends was such a success. And it all happened because it was the least EA thing out there. And there are lessons that I think we can learn from that. So yeah, there, there, there's that article. I'm very pleased with it. Um, so yeah, feel free to check it out if you so wish. Yeah, and and I guess I also want to like throw out like articles are really fun, really good, and not very popular these days. I I have one um, for five dollars on my Patreon that it, it unlocks the tier, and I I get into some really weird topics that wouldn't be as good a match for video. Like uh, I I talked to like riskier stuff, like like religious symbolism in in Zelda and Bloodborne. Yeah, you got to be careful on YouTube. Um, it's it's like walking into a shark tank sometimes. So I certainly used to use editorials for like, okay, this is something I just don't want to get into on YouTube. <laughs> I don't want to get into that situation, that environment, that argument. Right. Um, right. So yeah, just don't. on on the website, it's there are certain topics that are just easier to talk about because it doesn't become a slanging match. And let alone you're not going to see that on Twitter either because Twitter's almost worse because mm. it can make your phone blow up if people don't like you there. Uh, anyways, um, when I am not stressed out about being a shit tier e celeb, I uh, would, would would like to ask you, our humble listeners, to send in questions and dad den submissions to dad and sons podcast at gmail dot com. Yeah, send us questions, send us dad den submissions, send us videos of things, and also thanks to everyone who uh, clipped, who sent us emails of when George <laughs> yeah. said. I, I love garbage. garbage. And everyone who clipped that and then sent it to us, that was beautiful. I really am not looking forward to hearing you guys talk about the RE2 demo <laughs> when I edit this thing later. <laughs> <laughs> While you were in the toilet. <laughs> God damn it. My well, ego. that'll be a surprise for you later, won't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to find out what that's going to be over the next day. And until then, thank you guys so much for showing up. Thank you, especially Jim Sterling, for being here this week. Thanks, Jim. Thanks a lot. A pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Rest in peace, Matt, wherever he With is right now. That being said, of. Uh... What, how, how does the saying go? May, may the dad be with you, and also with you. May the divine dad shine upon you. <laughs> <laughs>